they just felt like they needed a, a fresh start. Uh, so I felt an enormous responsibility now as they're going into their next pregnancy that everything turned out as best as possible. So when they had their baby and I handed Mikey uh, to the mom and dad, they were just tears of joy. I am Caleb Dinsey, a precision ag specialist living in Aurora, South Dakota, and you are listening to the Vance Crow Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. Today, we interview Dr. Tim Philpott who's an OBGYN that welcomes new life into the world as he delivers babies. We thought that he was a fitting first interview for our five-part series we're calling Memento Mori. Memento Mori is a Latin phrase that means remember you will die. And while that could have really morbid connotation, I like to think of it as a way to remind yourself that no matter how monotonous or difficult life gets, you will die. It will be over. And so the moments that we do have conscious on this earth are so precious. So we put together a series that would try and cover the lifespan and maybe talk about things that are all around us, but we don't think about every day. So our first interview is with somebody that delivers babies. And the next one is with a psychologist that works with college students to help them understand what the aging process will be like so that they can make better decisions in the present about their finances, about the way they treat their bodies. It's a fascinating conversation. Then we'll talk with an in-home care specialist, a person that uh, delivers nursing and home care services so that people can stay living independently without going into a nursing home or retirement facility for as long as possible. After that, We bring in an estate planner and we talk all about what happens to your property after you die and how big of an impact you can have on the world from beyond the grave. Finally, we'll have our fifth and final part of the Memento Mori series with a funeral director on Halloween. This conversation was particularly interesting because there's so much about the dying process that if you've never experienced it, you wouldn't know anything about. Like, What happens? Who do you call? How does this work? What are you paying for? So we hope that you find not only this final episode interesting, but all five in this whole series to be something that uh, really connects with you, something that are either parts of your life now or things that you know you should be thinking about and preparing for. And really, as a whole, we hope that this really impacts the way you think about the preciousness and value of life. I know as the host of Legacy Interviews, where I sit down to record people's family stories, I've had the opportunity to get a firsthand look at what are the most important experiences that a person has that they want to pass on to their children and grandchildren. If you're interested in having me sit down with you or a loved one to record your family stories, to write down or get into video your wisdom that you've learned over a lifetime of living, then we'd love to have you visit LegacyInterviews.com. There you can schedule a time to sit down with me in these studios and have a deep and fulfilling conversation that allows you to put this down on the record to pass down to future generations. If you're interested in watching these interviews with your family, which we hear from clients all the time is the best part of the whole experience, and you want to do that over the Thanksgiving holiday, then you need to get your interview scheduled by October 23rd. That way we'll have plenty of time to make sure the video and audio looks and sounds great. So if you're interested in having us talk with a loved one, go to LegacyInterviews.com to find out more. All right, without further ado, let's go to the first of the Memento Mori series with Dr. Tim Philpott. Dr. Tim Philpott, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Excited to be here. So a man is about to walk into the the birthing room. His wife is about to have their first child. What should he know about what's about to happen? Well, the, the toughest thing I think for dads is to realize that they have very little control over the situation. And a lot of guys are used to having control in their lives, or at least think they do. Uh, so that's probably the hardest part for people, uh, for, for, the da- for, for dads and husbands, is to just realize they're along for the ride. Uh, and equally important, whatever their wife says, you do. 
How long? So I, I'm in the unusual position that, that I've seen a childbirth only via C-section. So I don't actually know what happens. But when you, we were sitting in the room waiting for childbirth to happen, we could hear the screams going on in the other right, room. Right, right. A little disconcerting. And I think most people ha only have like a Hollywood version of what it's like for a woman to have a baby. How much pain is involved in it? Well, these days, at least at the institution where I practice, uh, there's a majority of women do get epidurals. And so the pain is significantly decreased, of course, by that. But for those patients who do not have epidurals, the pain is almost universally described as the worst pain they've ever experienced. Um, but I do occasionally have patients who handle it like it's really no big deal. It's amazing. Like they just have that mental control where they, they don't experience pain in the same way. But for most people, it's the, it's the most intense and prolonged pain they've ever had. And what's the rate of people taking epidurals? Why? For us, it's about 85%. 80, so 15% don't do it out of, what, what are the reasons? Well, when you ask that question, most patients, we, some people call it going natural. That's a common phrase. We say unmedicated because sometimes natural people mean vaginal. But so for those unmedicated, the patients who decide to have an unmedicated vaginal delivery, uh, oftentimes they choose that um, because they want to see that they can get through it. You know, it's almost, I think of it a lot like people who choose to run a marathon. <laughs> they can, everyone knows you probably can do it, but do you really want to do it? And can you prove it to yourself that you can do it? So I think that's where a lot of people are coming from. Some people worry that the medications given during an epidural might be detrimental or harmful to the baby, but there's really no evidence for that. But I think that's another uh, reason that people might say. How does an epidural work? So the, the term epidural means it's on top of the dura, and the dura is a bag, of, a fibrous bag that kind of surrounds the spinal cord and holds in all that cerebral spinal fluid. So when you hear about people getting a spinal tap, they're going in with a needle. The, the, the procedure goes with a needle through between the vertebrae through that dura sac and takes some of that cerebral spinal fluid out. So... Uh, a spinal anesthetic is sort of the reverse of that, where you inject medicine directly into that fluid. But the epidural is on top of the dura, so it goes near that sac. There's a catheter that then allows the medicine to diffuse through that dura sac, and that's how it affects the spinal cord and the, the pain signals that travel through there. And if somebody is going through a pregnancy and they decide, I want to do a natural vaginal birth, they get halfway through the stream and decide, this pain is way more than I was expecting. Can you pop one in? Usually. Yeah. If it's a first time mom, so her labor would tend to take a little longer for a first time mom, you probably have time to get that epidural in. But sometimes people are going so fast and they're going through something called transition, which is a very rapid increase in their cervical dilation and an increase in their pain and the pressure and all the, the experiences that they're having uh, with, with their labor. When that ramps up, sometimes that means they're almost done. And so trying to get them in position for the epidural process, which can take, in some cases, more than 30 minutes, there may not be 30 minutes. The baby's coming in the next three minutes. So the good news about that is the pain's going to be over once that baby's out, or mostly. You know, as I think about it, like, there's probably not very many other positions in the world that see, I mean, even though it's only 15%, that see as much physical endurance of pain as somebody like an OBGYN. Well, and I would say that the labor and delivery nurses see a lot more than we do because they're with the patient for a much longer period of time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty incredible. And, and uh, you know, you realize that we're all kind of built the same, that when you get to a certain point of pain, we all are going to react in a very similar way. Like what? I, I don't think I've ever actually seen, I, mean, I certainly haven't seen labor pain. Yeah. Um, you, I would say that's a, for a lot of people, it's an out-of-body experience. You know, they just might start screaming, they might start yelling, they might start cussing, uh, they might, uh, you know, be, un, you, you really can't communicate with them when you, you may look at them and they're staring at you with glazed eyes, but you know that they're not really hearing you, they can't follow your instructions, so uh, it's, it's very much of an out-of-body experience for, for a lot of people. Have you ever experienced that much pain? Well, I broke my jaw when I was in first grade, and that was really, really painful, but I don't think it's the same, because labor pain is so long, you know, it's usually hours and hours and sometimes in some cases days. Uh, and that just takes an enormous toll on the, the psyche. Just, it, just that it just keeps going. Keeps and you coming. don't have an end in sight. Keeps and coming. Right. And of course it's all for what we hope is going to be a very happy moment and something somebody's been looking forward to for certainly their whole pregnancy, but maybe for decades. 
so that obviously motivates people, but uh, it's still very intense. And how do you see uh, dads reacting when things are really intense in the in the room? Yeah, most dads uh, wither a bit under that because they're something that they love is going through pain and they can't fix it. Uh, dads are also sometimes in a tough position uh, for these folks who want to have an unmedicated delivery where they've been instructed for months prior uh, not to allow the epidural <laughs> to happen. Like, even if I ask for the epidural... Don't let them give it to me. And so dads are really put in a tough spot when that happens because they can see the agony their wife is or their partner's experiencing, and they're not allowed to suggest the one thing that will really help. So they try to do a lot of massage, and you know, they've, they've probably been through lots of practices on how to get their wife through, their partner through that experience. But uh, it's tough for dads. And most of the time they, they really uh, sort of get pasty white and, and wither under that kind of intensity. When you're talking with people that are about to have a baby, what do you think is like the hardest thing for you to be able to communicate to them about what's about to happen? Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, the hardest thing for me to talk about is that it doesn't always go well, right? And so everybody is expecting the birth of their beautiful, healthy baby. Uh, nobody anticipates the baby is going to have an issue, whether it's a serious issue or even a minor issue. Uh, and that is really, really hard to talk to people about because they're seeing it in a much brighter, happier light uh, than those of us who have seen a lot of deliveries know it can go. And when somebody ends up having an, like um, either a stillbirth or or a um, just a rough preg like a delivery, do you pretty much know when that's going to happen ahead of time? No, oftentimes we don't know, uh, you know, because labor is long and in the beginning the baby's heartbeat looks great but all of a sudden the heartbeat starts to look abnormal or the mom's blood pressure changes or she starts bleeding and those are not things that we often can anticipate sometimes we know sometimes we know a baby's got a genetic problem or something that we're anticipating trouble uh, or a heart defect for example but oftentimes babies that get into trouble do it unexpectedly and then were they things that in retrospect you could say like, ah, oh, we should have known that, that, that that was coming or are there things that just happened as an, as an accident? That's a great question. And the answer is we always think first, should I have caught that? Should I have known? Should I have anticipated that? Because I think that's a natural human reaction. You know, I, I wish that I could have undone a problem before it ever happened. But the reality is these are really, really difficult things to predict. Uh, and some of them are, 100% unpredictable. And so you just have to be ready to react. Yeah, I know. I, one of the things that I talk with a lot of younger men about, because no one prepared me, I was not prepared for losing a pregnancy, right? Like for having a miscarriage, right? I, first of all, didn't know really that it was possible. I mean, I think I, you know, vaguely understood that. But like, not only that it was possible, but that it's actually relatively common. Very. Yeah, I always tell moms that are going through a uh, miscarriage that one out of three pregnancies ends in a loss of, of uh, usually a first trimester miscarriage, sometimes a little later. And I think that, I don't know if comfort's the right word, but it, at least it helps give perspective that patients don't feel like they're the only one experiencing it, which is probably how you felt when it was happening. Uh, and then what often happens is people come back and say, you know what, I talked to my mom, my aunt, my cousin, and they had one or two also. And I'd never known that, but yeah, I mean, it's sort of a sad way of saying it, but now that I'm in that club, people are more comfortable talking about it. It is. It's like a club almost. Like it's it's one of those things that if you're talking with somebody that didn't experience it, it's not that they can't understand, but it's like the, if you find out somebody did go through it, all of a sudden you feel like you're walking along a path and not the only one that had to do it. And, and somehow guilt feels less in that way. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think people experience that often. And so it helps to know they're not, that, that somebody's not alone. The, uh, but the first thing I say to people when it comes to miscarriage, uh, unless there's evidence to the contrary, which rarely, rarely there is, is that they didn't cause this to happen. That mo the vast, vast majority of miscarriages were predetermined. You know, at the moment of fertilization, this particular genetic makeup wasn't going to make it, but gets to a certain point before you dis discover that. Uh, and so I think that gives people comfort as well. So as an OBGYN, you are 
both seeing people at their absolute highest peak. They've just been given this miracle of life, but you also have to communicate some of the most, you know, frustrating, damaging news they've ever heard before. Right. That's very true. And, and when I first decided I was going into OBGYN and started talking to people about that professional choice, uh, most people would say, Oh, wow. You get to be such a, a part of such a happy time in people's lives which of course is true and what drew me to the profession, but you also have to be really good at giving bad news and, and comfortable spelling that out very clearly uh, and uh, not unemotionally, but you have to stay objective in the process. Uh, and so the, the, the hard news can be uh, an, an equal part of our job. Did you know that that uh, delivering bad news was going to be a part of this as you were like heading down this path? In sort of a vague sense, but I didn't really know what are the bad things that can happen in the world of OBGYN, uh, and you know it can it can be very devastating. And we're not really uh, trained heavily in, in that area. At least when I was in medical school, that was not a big part of our training. The whole communication uh, aspect it was more what you brought naturally to the to the table. Um, but it turned out that I was a good communicator with patients and could sort of uh, strike the proper emotional tone. And, and so it, it, it flowed pretty naturally for me. So the, the question, I don't know, do you, maybe people are too embarrassed to ask you, or maybe you get asked a lot is, uh, why would a man go into being an OBGYN? <laughs> uh, I had, I, it's funny cause I had the same question to myself. Uh, back when I was in medical school, which is when you have to make that decision. And my father, who was a general surgeon, uh, when I told him about it, his response was, well, isn't that a woman's job? <laughs> oh. <laughs> which, you know, was a, a bit tongue in cheek, but he, you know, the general surgeon, I guess that sort of, uh, was the perspective. Um, and what I learned, in fact, I, one of the people I still work with, uh, a guy who was the chairman of our department was a few years ahead of me. And when I was in medical school, he was already a, an attending physician, OBGYN. And, and I asked him that very question. I said, so what's it like being a man going into OBGYN? Can you, can you carry your career along? And he said a very uh, memorable response, which was, there's always room for good doctors. So he said, just be good. And, and if you love what you're doing, you'll be good, you know, good or hopefully great at it. And, uh, and everything else will kind of fall into place. And it was great advice. It worked, it worked that way for me. Yeah. I mean, and I think with the OBGYN world, it's probably all word of a largely word of mouth, right? Like when, when we were looking for one, you go ask the people you love and care about, who would you go to? So being a good one spreads probably rather quickly. Very true. It's a word of mouth business for sure. Unless you're in a subspecialty, you know, if somebody needs a, an oncologist, for example, if they had ovarian cancer, usually that person gets referred by another doctor rather than word of mouth, but word of mouth is still very important for those folks as well. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's our biggest referral source of course, is other patients. Um, it's really helpful if you take care of patients who are also doctors because then they tell their family and their patients about uh, hopefully the good experience they had with you. Speaking of like other doctors. So if you had daughters and they were pregnant, but they were far away from you. You didn't know which doctor to send them to. How would you tell them to judge a particular OB? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I, typically I would say start by asking folks that you know that have kids, you know, especially younger kids, so that's fresher in their minds, and ask who their OB was, what did they like about him or her, and and uh, start down that start start down that pathway. But my advice to everybody it wouldn't just be my daughters, but everybody moving into a new town is call labor and delivery at the hospital where people seem to want to go to have their babies. Uh, you have to find that out by asking folks and those, the labor and delivery nurses will be very honest generally. Oh, really? Yes. So maybe they have an ulterior motive, but most of the time they'll say, Oh yeah, we, we've heard of Dr. Smith and or we know Dr. Smith. She's here all the time and, and is fabulous or, well, you might like the partner better because of this or that. So uh, it's usually a free and pretty reliable source of uh, referral. Does your doctor matter in having a baby? That's uh, that's an interesting question. I think the answer is yes. I hope the answer is yes because that's one of the things that motivates me is to try to be excellent. Uh, but uh, I think most people really want to have a connection, an emotional connection with their OBGYN. 
Uh, and so I think that is a very, it's a great comfort when you have that connection, you feel like there's a greater level of trust. Uh, and that's a huge part of what we do. Unfortunately, there's a lot, a lot of patients experience more of a, a group practice, um, process where they might see a different doctor at each visit and they're not sure which of those four or five doctors will actually be doing the delivery. And that still works great for a lot of, uh, folks. Um, we just don't structure our practice that way because we really want to have a relationship with our individual patients as best we can. You talked about that connection. Like, what is it? Can you walk me through from the beginning? Somebody first meets you all the way through. Yeah, I, I would say it starts with they've heard good things. So they, their sister is your patient. So now they're coming because they trust their sister's re- recommendation. Uh, so you're already off on a good foot. Uh, but now you have to live up to whatever they, whatever hype has uh, preceded the, the visit. Uh, and so I always want to make sure that I get very quickly into what the patient's concerns are or what the patient's questions are. So for a new OB patient, obviously people want the general guidelines for what's how do I behave safely in pregnancy, what are the things I should and shouldn't do. Uh, so that's more of a template. But I always early in the conversation, say, let's start with your questions and I can fill in the rest. And I think hopefully people appreciate that and, and realize that I'm there to listen to them, not to dictate something to them. What can you tell about a person based on the questions they ask? Uh, anxiety, you can tell pretty quickly. Yeah, so the the anxious patients, and I, we understand, it's a very anxious, provoking experience, anxiety-provoking experience. Uh but they tend to have lots of questions, lots of detailed questions. And, uh, and, and oftentimes we'll just say, look, I'm anxious about, or I, ha- I have a lot of anxiety. Uh, so you can tell that pretty quickly. And you often can tell if people have medical backgrounds based on the way they ask questions. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's hard because uh, they feel like they should know more because they went through medical school or are in the nursing field, but they don't know OBGYN. And so I always tell people, even even people that are OBGYNs that I've taken care of, I say, I always say, I'm going to take care of you and talk to you like I do with everybody. Cause I don't want to leave something out and I don't want to assume, you know, something and you can always hit the fast forward button. If you, if you feel like you're, 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 you're comfortable with that particular subject. I know when we were getting ready to go through the delivery, we watched all these videos, COVID right. was going on and we were like, all right, we can't go to the regular classes. Let's do this one online. And one of the things I noticed was that there was definitely an air of like adversarialness between like the person that was operating as the midwife and the the medical system. Where do you think that comes from? Yeah, it's a. Uh, I, I guess it's sort of a long-standing uh, disagreement about the philosophy of of labor and delivery, where you know in the medical field we're trained to intervene, give medications. Uh, do surgeries, cut episiotomies, you know, those are sort of the things we have to be trained on. And a nurse midwife, for example, learns very differently that labor is a natural process that if you kind of stay out of the way and just support the mother that, you know, the vast majority of the time it will work out well. Uh, So it's really just different philosophies coming at the same problem. And so I think that creates some of that. uh, I, I hear what you're saying with an adversarial Relationship. I think that's probably too strong of a word. I would just say that it's philosophical differences. Oh, and I was prepared. Like the way that the woman described it, you could tell she had dealt with some trauma. R- oh, right. Like so, so like the look of fear and terror in her eyes. Right. And I think that she started her whole program as like, uh, I want to make sure nobody has this happen to them. But I noticed that d- during the first delivery, I was very much like on guard, like, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, I got to watch out for these medical people because they're going to try and do the Western medical system to us. Exactly. And it it definitely, um, I I mean, I can understand if you had a traumatic experience that you would want to convey that, but it didn't seem like what she was saying was so far away from what is maybe mainstream of upper middle class suburban families now. Right. And, and like anything, it's sort of how the message is delivered. Uh, but yeah, I, I think there, there's a healthy dose of both that's appropriate and we have learned, and I would say that the OB literature has supported a more watchful waiting approach instead of a, if this doesn't end by this time, you better get in there and do a C-section. So 
like most industries, I'm sure it's sort of, there's a pendulum that swings back and forth, but uh, I do think we're, we have become as an industry more patient and the data supports interven- less intervention, which is, I think, good. Yeah, probably not a bad thing to have all the that that sort of tension there to, you know, I think if you're doing something every day and you're getting very, very efficient at it, you can start to take the people out of it. And the midwives are, I don't, I don't want to say more focused on people than doctors, but they're not a part of the system that says efficiency in order to stay alive. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think um, it's an example of if you have a tool, you're more likely to use that tool as opposed to if you don't have C-section, for example, available to you, well, you're going to use a whole bunch of other creative solutions. Uh, and, and then there's always the legal aspect of, you know, well, if you don't do something by a certain point uh, and there's an injury of some sort, you know, were you responsible for that and shouldn't you have intervened? And so that that's also going on in the minds of, of the OB uh, who's responsible. In the midwife classes, they were talking a lot about self-advocacy. And I found myself, you know, kind of rolling my eyes during this. But then I realized, like, I'm an extremely disagreeable person. And I like can I can speak up for myself. I would imagine that people do get a little overwhelmed in the system. Now that I've seen like it from the inside. Right. How do you make sure people are stick, sticking up for themselves or being heard? Because it's, it's such a confusing time. It's hard. But I also think that goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago in terms of building a relationship with a patient. And you kind of know who's more like Vance and willing to speak up for themselves and who's going to sort of defer and not uh, speak up when they really do feel like there's a problem. Uh, and so I think the, the physician should be a, an advocate uh, for that patient who they know. Uh, and have known for many months. And the nurses are very well trained in that, in that experience as well, kind of recognizing when a patient needs something but isn't, isn't saying anything. But boy, I think that is a great skill for moms to, to be, be comfortable with. What things should they be looking out for that they would need to advocate for themselves about? Yeah, I, I mean, a big thing in labor specifically is pain control. We talked about epidurals earlier. And you know, what is their ideal scenario? I think most patients want to go into labor on their own and deliver vaginally, have everything go smoothly and, you know, experience some pain, but not extreme pain. Uh, it's just not everybody gets that lucky. So it doesn't always happen that way. But to your question, I think patients need to know what is important to them and kind of put that out right away. So once they arrive and they're getting settled into the labor and delivery process, the, the labor nurse needs to know what are their, what are their primary, other than obviously a healthy baby and a healthy mom, what are their primary goals? What's your relationship with the dad in all of this, right? Cause he's not actually the patient, but maybe the one in charge. How does all that work? Yeah. I connect with the dads a lot because I'm a dad myself and I was the, I was the guy holding my wife's leg while our babies were being born. And, uh, and I understand that. And it, I was, I laugh with the nurses because I say, Seeing moms cry is a very emotional experience, but when the dad cries, it gets me every time. I mean, I, I start <laughs> I start getting teary myself because it, it connects with something I experienced myself. Um, so, yeah, the the dads. Um, so I guess I lost my train of thought on what. Well, the you're building relationships with right. dads, and and you know, at some point, there are times when the dad has to make life or death decisions, right? Right, right, and. So keep, keeping the dad engaged throughout the process and hopefully I've met them through the labor or through their prenatal care so that labor is not the very first time that, that I'm interacting with that person. Uh, but yeah, it is, it's a, it's a big deal because sometimes dad has to speak for, for his partner. How, uh, how often does that happen that they need to, that something happens life or death? It's, it's fortunately rare. Yeah. And, and moms are usually able to speak for themselves, but there are times, for example, when a mom is, uh, rushed back to do a C-section because she's bleeding, for example. There's something called a placental abruption where the placenta tears away from the wall of the uterus, and that's life-threatening for the baby because oxygen levels to the baby can drop very quickly. Uh, And so if the mom doesn't have an epidural under that circumstance, she has to have a general anesthetic for the surgery, which means she's all the way asleep. She's got a tube in her breathing, in her trachea, uh, and she's on the ventilator, so obviously she can't speak for herself. And the dad might have to make a very, very hard decision during that surgery 
about, say, a blood transfusion or something like that. When uh, when parents are walking into the hospital, you know, they're they're standing up, they're, everything's going well. Uh, what emotion do you think is the is the right one to have as you're as you're walking into there? What emotion? Emotion. What? what how emotion? should they be feeling as they're walking in? Uh, to have the baby at that moment. Uh, yeah, I'd say excitement. You know, I mean, this is thrilling. This is going to be something they will remember forever. Uh, and so they should be excited about it. Um, that I'd say that's the primary emotion, but also, uh, kind of a willingness to accept. I'm not sure if willingness is an emotion, but an acceptance of the possibility that things are going to go a little differently than they had scripted in their mind. Yeah, I, I, so the first time uh, we had our daughter, the, the whole process took a really long time. The second time we had a planned um, C-section, so we knew pretty much exactly when it was going to happen. Right. And I think the most valuable thing that ever happened to me was the 30 minutes or so while they're getting my wife prepped because I actually sat there and meditated, mm -hmm. and I had never done meditation before an important thing. And I was like, this is all going to go well. I don't even really know why we're doing this. And then we did have challenges, right? Like the oxygen levels of the baby weren't right. And uh, I was really glad to have been so patient just before that, because if I hadn't been, I'm fairly certain I would have felt more um, alarm as opposed to just urgency. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. I would say dads go one of two directions in that waiting chair, we call it. Uh they either get into a zone like you did, which was self-imposed, which is impressive that you made that decision. I wish all the dads would do that because the other thing we see is dads are just like a uh, you know, wild animal in a cage. They're just scratching. <laughs> they can't sit still. They're up and down. They're on their, you know, they're texting somebody. They have to go to the bathroom again. They have to get another drink of water. Uh, they're nervous, of course, and, and who wouldn't be? They're about to uh, go through something that is potentially dangerous with their partner. So... Uh, I think meditation is a great, we should probably have a sign there to say, this is how to, how to get into the zone. Yeah. And it's a really like where, where I was, it's a really like nondescript place. It's just like, you're sitting in front of some doors and there's a table over there. It's and unimpressive. Like, it's, just, yeah. Yeah, it's just like, you have no idea like, Hey, I'm going to walk in there. And when we walk out, no matter what things are going to be different. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you, you handled it beautifully. Um, so I know we keep talking about things going wrong. But, uh, you know, when everything goes right, there's, there's, I mean, there's things to talk about. It's the miracle of life. But let's talk about things like induction and uh, why you would choose to induce a baby to come as opposed to just waiting for it to come out. So there are times when mom is having a particular health problem, medical problem, like high blood pressure. So there's a condition called preeclampsia, where typically it's in late stages of pregnancy, mom's blood pressure will rise. And the physiology of that is that there's a breakdown in small blood vessels throughout the body. So the mom can bleed, for example, the mom can have seizures if there's bleeding, uh, you know, fluid changes and bleeding into her brain. So it can get very serious and dangerous. And the cure for preeclampsia is delivery. So induction of labor, if that's appropriate based on how far along the mom is, uh, is often recommended in the setting of preeclampsia. But one big change that has occurred in the last several years is in uh, August of 2018, there was an article that came out about a trial called the ARRIVE trial, A-R-R-I-V-E, -R -R -E, ARRIVE trial. And it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is, of course, very prestigious. Uh, and it was a large study that looked at the risk of induction causing C-section. And what was remarkable, surprised the industry, I would say, is that the C-section rate was lower in the moms who got induced at 39 weeks, so a week before their due date, as compared to those moms who went on. And so the whole philosophy about induction started to shift uh, when that came up because in my training, we were taught something very different, that C-section rates were much higher if you were going to induce patients. Uh, so this study refuted that belief and, uh, and was very well done. It was a large study. They had a lot of patients in it. When you induce somebody, how does that work? So induction basically means get the process of labor started. So there's two different things you have to think about. The first is, is the cervix ready for induction? And that means is it dilated, is it softened, is it thinned out a bit? The term we use for that is effacement. And so if the, the cervix is more on the ready side, like it's 
one and a half to two centimeters dilated and 50% of face, then that patient can just move on to the second phase of labor or a second phase of induction. The first type of induction is prepping the cervix or getting it to soften it, getting it to open a little bit. Uh, we call it cervical ripening. And there's different medicines we use to do that. But that adds time to the process. You have a bunch of medicines at your disposal for Basically that? Basically three. Yeah. Uh, or three different techniques, I should say. But but they And they have various uh, situations that they're better used in. Uh, but once the cervix is moved past the ripening stage and is now ready for the actual labor to begin, we use Pitocin, which is synthetic oxytocin, a hormone that the brain makes. And when you hear the, when I hear oxytocin, I think of some radio lab I heard a long time ago on NPR talking about that's like the love chemical or something like that. What, what is oxytocin? Well, oxytocin has a lot of different functions in the body. Uh, we, we focus on it more because it stimulates the uterine muscle to contract. So that's the, that's the benefit of it. In the, in the, and that's what pushes the baby. Right. Out. So the, so the uterus is a muscular balloon basically. And when that balloon squeezes, whatever's inside that balloon is going to come out the opening, uh, just like <laughs> toothpaste does. And, uh, that's, that is a, re- well, a requirement for a vaginal delivery. You have to have contractions. Uh, so the oxytocin or Pitocin. Wait, and that's what the contractions are is the uterine bubble. It's the uterine down. balloon. It's just a balloon shaped muscle. And when that muscle squeezes, the balloon gets smaller. Oh, I definitely didn't know that. Yes. I thought contractions were the opening of the of of the vaginal like whoa whoa oh no, no it's all up in the upper abdomen because this uterus is now enlarged into the upper abdomen and so that muscle basically just it goes from this size to this size by contraction and anything inside of it is getting expelled and those contractions are the painful part yes now there's other parts of labor that are painful with as the head's coming down pushing down this is more what you were referring to pushing down on the pelvic bones so that's very painful as bones are being pushed apart and all the muscles that are attached to those bones and then creating a passageway through the vagina. That head is pushing on the rectum, it's pushing on the bladder. So all those structures are feeling that and there's varying degrees of pain from it. Yeah, I remember as we were getting close, Anne, who's a physical therapist, would always talk about the laxity of her of her joints and it didn't make any sense to me, but it's because the bones have to like, the, the what is it the ligaments the pelvis like, has to expand yeah, yeah. they're letting go of how tense they are and then they come apart exactly and then after a few months they tighten back up again at least they're supposed to at least they're supposed to yeah and so i i know i'm not sure whether we i think we should keep going on the delivery part of it so if in the vaginal part of the delivery when everything goes like according to plan how long does this take what is like what's the general like I've never seen one, so I right. don't actually know. <laughs> well, you've seen Hollywood, right? Right. As we talked about. Um, yeah, so the average first-time mom, her labor will take about 18 hours. and they From a- the first contractions? All well, the way from the time they're in labor. So labor is defined as regular uterine contractions with a cervical change. So, for example, somebody who's contracting, you often hear people, uh, patients describe Braxton Hicks contractions, which are just very short sort of, practice contractions that the uterus is going through for months often before delivery. Uh, that's not really labor until those contractions get longer, usually going from maybe 20 seconds long to a minute long, and then produce some cervical dilation or cervical change. Um, so from the time labor begins, on average, about 18 hours is, a, is an estimate, a good estimate for first-time mom. And, and subsequent mom, so a second or later baby, more average, uh, average is more like 12 hours and sometimes it's 12 minutes. So there's a great wide variation, obviously. And when you're going through this process, you talked about C-sections, you know, not being prompted by induction. When do you decide, all right, we're not going the vaginal route. We're going to go C-section. Yeah. I mean, you talked about your second baby's delivery was a scheduled C-section. So sometimes it's a decision based on what happened in the, in the past. But I think your question more is about somebody who's laboring. When do we make the call? Okay, this isn't working. We have to go to C-section. So there's some basic categories that that would fall into. One is that the baby's not doing well. So we're monitoring the baby's heartbeat with a 
uh, a ultrasound device on the outside, which is more of a, like a motion detector so it can read the baby's heartbeat. And the other is more of a pressure detector so it can read the contractions. And through that external monitoring, and sometimes the monitoring gets changed to internal through the vagina monitoring. But through that monitoring, we can determine what the baby's heart rate is. And the pattern of the heart rate, fetal heart rate tracing, uh, gives us an idea about the oxygen level in the baby. And it's not a perfect tool, but it's better than nothing, certainly. And, uh, and has uh, and is used in the vast majority of labors because we believe that it does give us valid information about the baby's oxygen status, which, of course, affects their overall health. Um, if the baby's heartbeat tracing looks abnormal and there are certain specific patterns we look for, then we might say we're concerned or we might say this is no longer safe and we need to go back and do a, do a C-section. Uh, another category of reason for deciding on C-section is that the labor is just not progressing. So the patient dilates to seven centimeters. She has plenty of contractions. We've tried all sorts of different positions. She's been doing that for many, many hours and the cervix just won't go past seven centimeters. So that would be a situation where we'd say, well, this is a, an arrest of labor and uh, we have to do a C-section because we just don't think the baby's going to fit. When I saw my first C-section, I was, uh, of course, caught off guard, right? Like, there is a lot of pulling and, like, you know, <laughs> like, strength involved. Right. Walk me through a C-section. So, uh, hopefully we're not rushing when we're doing a C-section because some of those more emergency scenarios that you and I were talking about are much faster, and so you can't be as careful. But generally, say, in a scheduled repeat C-section, uh, we get make sure the patient is under adequate anesthesia. So that's the spinal anesthetic in many cases. And we test that. We pinch the mom's skin very hard to make sure she can't feel it. And we warn moms that there can be a sensation of moving. So I always remind people, if you've ever had Novocaine for dental work, you can tell that the dentist... You feel pressure. Right, is doing something. You know, there's, there's, ten, there's touching, but it just isn't painful. So that's what numbing the, the pain signals will do. It doesn't numb the touch signals or the pressure signals as much. Uh, so mom's under complete anesthesia. We make sure we, she, we have her prepped and everything in the area is sterile. Uh, we make an incision. Uh, most people know it's sort of right along the pubic hair line and about 10 centimeters in length, so big enough to, to allow the baby to come out. And then we go through several layers. Uh, the last layer that we go through is, well, I guess second to last layer. And we, each layer is another cut for you? Yeah, and it's the, the skin is usually cut with a scalpel, uh, but then layers below that might be cut with a, a cauterizing tool that's called a bovi, which cauterizes and cuts at the same time. Then we might use scissors. Uh, and then this is getting to what you were referring to earlier with pulling and, and strength maneuvers. Uh, sometimes we actually stretch the tissues apart. Uh, so the abdominal muscles, you know, the six-pack muscles, the rectus muscles, they're just separated in the midline or in the middle of the body, and we pull those apart because we don't want to cut them because muscles uh, don't heal very well when you cut them. It's very painful. They bleed a lot. So we'd rather stretch them open rather than cut them open. Uh, and uh, But the uterus, we have to cut that usually with a scalpel. Uh, and then the very last layer is the bag of water, which we have to pop and then out comes the baby. And uh, what can go wrong during a C-section? I'd say the primary thing we worry about is bleeding. So the uterus has an enormous amount of blood flowing through it because obviously it has to supply the baby with oxygen. Uh, and so that's almost always our, our first concern is that the mom could be bleeding excessively. Uh, obviously, while we're in the process of delivering the baby, our first concern is getting the baby out safely and, and not spending too much time uh, that could be putting the baby at risk if we're going too slowly. Uh, and then we do worry about infection. So especially in labor, if a mom has labored and then had a C-section, she's got a much more increased risk for infection either in the uterus or in the tissues around the uterus or in the skin incision. Why? So the bacteria that naturally live in the vagina, they're very healthy bacteria in the vagina. They, during labor, when, especially when the bag of water is broken, now have access to the uterine cavity. So over time, the bacteria ascend, move from the vagina up into the uterus. And if things move along quickly enough, then that might not allow enough time for an infection to, to occur. But in a longer labor or the more aggressive type of bacteria, that could create an infection. So, you know, the C-section gives you this, uh, we know when it's going to happen, 
it feels like you're maybe in more control. What are the downsides of a C-section? Well, just these things we were talking about, the things that can go wrong. So the chance for a blood transfusion is higher if you do a C-section. chance for infection is higher. And the pain generally is higher with a C-section because that's... Really? Well, the skin incision uh, is, a, is a guaranteed pain. Uh, whereas with a vaginal delivery, especially the mom who doesn't have any tearing of her perineum uh, or the vaginal area when they deliver, she's going to have much less pain after the delivery than the C-section patient. But some patients with a vaginal delivery do have terrible tearing or have uh, large injuries to that vaginal part of their bodies. And so those patients can have enormous amount of pain as well. So yeah, I don't really, know with certainty. I really underestimated, you know, my wife was a swimmer, you know, six pack abs. So I, I didn't really know anything at all about a C-section, but even less did I know about well, if you do a C-section, now you are both a new mother and a post-surgery patient. And that was like uh, really caught me off guard because that that's a different thing. You know, she can't just get up and walk around and pick up the baby and do all the things that you would expect to be able to do after a pregnancy. Right, exactly. And, and even an elite athlete like your wife is, uh, you know, sort of not brought to their knees, but they're, they get slowed down by by what we always refer to as major abdominal surgery, you know, it, it's real. And for the baby, what's the difference between doing a vaginal birth and a C-section? So, and, and, you know, we talked about emergency C-sections. So that's kind of a different thing, I think, than what you're asking about, because that the biggest difference there is that the baby would be potentially harmed seriously by waiting for a vaginal delivery. So I think that's a, that's kind of a different category, but, but generally speaking, let's say you had a mom who could do either one. And she elects to have a, a repeat C-section rather than attempt a vaginal delivery. Uh, probably the biggest effect on the baby is that uh, and we're learning. I think we just barely know much about this, but we're learning that the baby doesn't get all the natural bacteria in the same way uh, in the baby system because the baby gets what we call the, the bacterial flora. So that's all the bacteria that live in our system. We get those from our parents generally. And most of the time, at least the belief is that initiate the, the initial exposure that a person gets to their bacterial flora is from their mother during childbirth while they're being born. Uh, and so obviously if you're born by C-section without any labor, uh, that bacterial exposure is markedly less. So we're trying to understand better what are the best ways of making sure those babies get the proper flora in their system, even if they were born through a sterile cesarean section. Is there a way to do it? Well, people try to have looked at and, and attempted to do what's called vaginal seeding, which is to take some of the vaginal fluid and actually put it in the baby's mouth. But what has been shown from that is that there is a, uh, an increased risk for introducing bad bacteria. And babies, some babies have gotten very sick from that process. So I think the bottom line is we don't really understand how it happens uh, in the healthiest possible way. So eventually, someday, I think we'll understand that better. So we'll be able to protect those C-section babies a little bit better. Yeah, I came to find out after the C-section that uh, the pushing process mm -hmm. itself actually like pushes all the fluid out of the baby and makes it so they're ready for the ready for breathing oxygen. Right, and that is very true. Uh, it's usually a very short-lived effect, uh, but right, it's the lungs are basically sponges full of fluid when the baby's inside the mom. Uh, and through the delivery process vaginally that a lot of that fluid gets squeezed out and the baby's able to cough or spit a lot of that out. Uh, so they tend to be better breathers uh, in that scenario. C-section babies, especially if there's been no labor, no squeezing of any kind, they tend to take a bigger drink of the fluid as they're, that's well, how we describe it at least, uh, as they're being delivered during the C-section. And so their lungs have more fluid in them and that baby has to fight a little bit more to get that fluid out. Yeah, I don't think I've ever had any color be more burned into my brain than the than the blue that came from <laughs> from uh, you know our daughter, second daughter, not getting all the oxygen at right. first, and like you see a pink baby, and then they start becoming blue and then purple, and that that color in my mind, I don't think I'll ever forget. Right, you just instinctively know that's wrong. not good. It's yeah, the it's wrong not color, not right. right? Right, and you know we you, you hear people joke about holding their breath until they turn blue in the face, but that's really what does happen. Uh, and I laughed a little bit when you were saying that because I think every new, every person experiencing childbirth for the first time is shocked at that exact experience. Uh, 
Uh, but generally, those babies pink up. You know, most babies pink up very quickly. And if they aren't, there's a lot of me- methods and materials in the delivery room or operating room to to get the oxygen to them. Talk a little bit about the feeling of joy when when the baby comes out, and now you get to hand it. What what what's going on in your brain? Joy for the doctor. Yeah, uh, it. I, I'm actually getting a little chill thinking about it because it always reminds me of the the experience I had becoming a dad for the first, second, and third time, uh, and just how how what a blessing it is, and how it changes your life in so many wonderful ways. And I, I sort of have this big flashback when I'm having that experience, especially with first time parents, because they're so blown away by this happening. They can't even believe this is real. Uh, and I always tell patients, it'll be two weeks before you really believe this happened. Yeah. Oh, so I you agree believe it's like, this is actually our baby and this baby is staying here for the rest of our lives. Well, at least for the next 20 years. Uh, so it, it, I, I have, uh, I think joy is the right word. Uh, I feel a lot of pride because these are patients who I've gotten to know over the term of their pregnancy and I'm getting to an age now where my kids are in, uh, you know, in their twenties and thinking about their own children. And, and so I'm feeling very, maybe a little bit uh, paternalistic or something like that, where I'm just very proud that this young person has gone through this process, has made it happen, has survived it both physically and emotionally. And, uh, and there's a lot of high fives in the room. It, you know, I had a cardiologist on one of my very first guests of the podcast, and uh, he talked about how most of the patients he sees, right, it's not good that they're seeing him to begin with, right? You know, and then it, basically he had to come to terms with, in order to be a cardiologist over the long term, like I'm here to relay information and to help them get where they want to go, but it was really focused around death, right? Your experience of it is wildly different than that. I agree. And I think that's a major reason I picked OBGYN because I, I was not as great at the death and the sickness as I was at the happier, uh, generally happier or problem solving uh, and ending up with something very good. Um, so you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that you have to ask yourself when you're going through your medical school training, what, what am I comfortable with? Yeah, because he would, he, like, he's a wonderful man. He's an exceptional doctor, but he does come off as maybe not cold, but, but distant in some way, right? Mm-hmm. Because you'd have to be, right? It's the same as being a funeral director. You have to both be empathetic to the people, but if you carried that home every night, you, I don't know how you could possibly do it. I agree. So you have to put up a, I would think you have to yeah. put up a, a layer or but two. Yours seems more, actually seems harder. Right. It seems like you have to both be available for the joy, but then also not crippled by the grief if something goes wrong. True. Uh, and that's a, a very good word for it. I think it is crippling. Obviously, for the patient, it, it can be devastating. Uh, and for us, it it takes a big piece out of your soul. How how often do you have to deal with that? Uh, fortunately, not very often, uh, but you carry it with you. So it's it's a cumulative thing. It's not Oh. Sort of you had a bad thing happen and you shake it off and, and walk away. You know, you remember those things as, as the physician and uh, and you carry with you. But that's an important part of being successful at this job is you have to be able to still function and not be remain crippled. You know, so, for example, if something bad occurs, uh, you, you know, you, you're going to feel that it's going to be a very emotional for some period of time. But you have to be able to move on and 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 continue to, to stay objective. Yeah. And to be the professional in that sort of a situation, like I think the natural inclination you were talking about when somebody's experiencing a huge amount of pain, they want to swear or they want to, right. you know, like have loud noises. You could be in a different pain than the parents, but pain, but yet you have to stay above water. Right. Yeah. And, and that was something I also learned about myself in training is that I, in that, in those situations when the, the, there's chaos. Uh, I was able to calm myself and stay focused. Uh, but you have to be able to do that because it gets pretty crazy sometimes. If you hadn't been an OBGYN, what would you have used your particular set of skills for? I think about that sometimes. I really don't know. I, it, it, I always wanted to go into medicine. My, as I was 
saying earlier, my uh, father was a general surgeon and it just seemed a completely natural fit for me. But if I couldn't have picked OBGYN and had to pick a different, uh, a different profession within inside within medicine, uh, it would have, I'm sure been something procedural, you know, cause I really do like working with my hands and doing surgeries and doing, doing procedures. Uh, but I don't know what it would be. The, the thing I would miss, uh, is that generally I get to take care of people over a long period of time in their lives. Uh, maybe even as teenagers, you know, I have some patients who I first met when they were teenagers having difficulties with their menstrual periods. Then they decided to have children and I went through that process with them. And then they had some gynecologic problems later in life. Maybe they developed breast cancer later in life. You know, those are all things that uh, I would uh, help the patient through. And that arc of the experience through a patient's lifetime is, is, I don't know if it's completely unique to, to OBGYN, maybe family practice obviously would be another, another uh, area, but, uh, but it's something I find very special. Have you delivered any children from the people that you delivered? Not yet, but, but are my, you getting to that? My age colleagues. Or? Yeah. I'm at that point. Cause I've been, <laughs> I've been in the practice 24 years. So uh, my colleagues who are, are older than me have said, it's a really wild experience, you know, to think, man, I delivered this person as a baby and now I'm delivering this person's baby. We earlier mentioned COVID and uh, the complications. So Ann and I had our first child during the COVID times, and it was uh, it was scary because this was back when we literally had no idea what was going on. We were watching images on TV where people would be dragging a body, and if it fell out of the coffin, they just run away from it, right? So it was high scary. intensity. Yeah. What was the experience of you know helping mother? You know, pregnancy didn't stop, deliveries didn't stop. How did all that go? Yeah, uh, you're right. It was a very scary time, mostly because we just didn't know uh, a lot of things. Still don't know a lot of things. But the other problem, uh, the other concern that we all had was, what is the impact going to be on babies? And and when someone's pregnant, we don't know that till the baby's born, obviously, and we're we're uh, doing various tests. So the, our most of us had the initial fear of, boy, if this affects fetuses in a dangerous way, uh, this is going to be a true calamity. Fortunately, that was not the case, and, and most babies, most fetuses and young children, uh, even back in the beginning of COVID, were not having, some did, but a very small percentage had any serious problems. Uh, but it was hard because patients couldn't have their team around them. There was even a time at some hospitals, I think New York is one that I recall, but it never happened for us at Missouri Baptist, but uh, there was a time, there were places where patients were forced to have their baby without even their partner. There. Ooh. Can you imagine? No, no. For the partner, for the baby and for the mom. I mean, it was just awful for everybody. Uh, we fortunately never got to that point, but it was, we did for a long time have it limited to just the, the, the dad basically. In some ways it was a unique experience because like we had one nurse at a time, mm -hmm. right. there was nobody else around. Like it was a very insulated experience. I have to imagine unique for most people. I mean, unless you were out on the plains, you know, doing like a Laura Ingalls Wilder type birth, right. It wouldn't have been that just you and mom and one nurse or one doctor, right. Uh, a Spartan crew. Yeah, I agree. It was, uh, it was a very odd time. We were lucky. We didn't have any really, we didn't have too many super scary experiences. Uh, I did have one patient who got severely ill and had to have her baby by emergency C-section about seven weeks early. So that was a very touch. because she had COVID. Her COVID was so severe; she was intubated, and she actually got transferred down to Barnes. And uh, it was it was very very scary because this was early on again when there were basically no treatments other than supportive care. Yeah, and I guess if you were talking earlier about preeclampsia and all of the challenges with high blood pressure and COVID, some sometimes strikes people really hard with right. the amount of uh, increase in blood pressure. Right. Right. Exactly. So we, uh, did you deliver babies with, uh, moms that were tested positive for sure. COVID? Yeah, absolutely. What happens? Well, really not much. I mean, honestly, most of those moms did fine. Uh, we did have some moms have to go to the intensive care unit because of their own breathing problems. Uh, sometimes both mom and baby were in the intensive care units, uh, for various reasons. So that was always very dis uh, distressing, but most of the time moms, cause they're young, healthy people otherwise uh, would recover and, and it would, it would all be okay in the end. Uh, but we also had a special area that we took care of those moms on the fourth floor of our hospital. 
So you had to gown up and it was much more of a production to go in and take care of those folks. So you yourself as the doctor had to dress differently. Were you right? What, what all was your, how did your garments change? Well, we have a yellow smock basically that we wear, uh, that's uh, supposed to protect our clothing gloves. Of course we had to wear, uh, eye protection. We had to wear a mask and it was always an N95. Uh, and you know, you just had to be trying to share, uh, you know, aerosolized droplets as little as possible. <laughs> so what do we now know about, uh, COVID now? that we've had some time vaccines, things like this. Well, as it relates to pregnancy, you know, the, the American college of OBGYN, and the CDC both do recommend that pregnant moms get vaccinated against COVID. Uh, there does not appear to be any health risk of the vaccine itself to, to moms or to babies. And, you know, currently the, the Omicron variant uh, booster is available and, and we're advising people that that's safe and effective uh, and, that it's it, we leave it up to moms to decide, but that if they feel comfortable doing the vaccination, that it's a it's a safe uh, practice, safe choice. What do you think is going to happen with COVID in the future? Well, I'm like a lot of the people who really are experts who say this is be- going to become an endemic. You know, it's going to be like the flu and colds, and there'll be a season to it, and most likely we'll get an annual or maybe it's every other year vaccine against the latest version of COVID, just like we do for the flu. So we talked earlier about, you know, the pregnancy, the, the having the baby, things that can go wrong. What about after the fact? You know, mom has the baby. How, how does she get back to normal? Yeah, I think we folk, most OBGYNs focus a lot on getting moms better physically. But we certainly know that, that postpartum blues, postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, postpartum psychosis, you know, that these are very real things. Uh, it's just hard. You can't see it physically, and uh, and it's a much more challenging issue to to help moms work through. Uh, so again, we 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 can focus more on the physical because those are things we can see and and treat more more easily generally. Uh, but once mom is through the physical uh, healing, we see people back at six weeks postpartum generally, sometimes quicker, but generally it's six weeks postpartum, and we try to take an assessment of their mental well-being. You know, are they handling the sleeplessness of a new baby? Are they w- dealing well with their families? You know, we ask questions like, do you want to take care of the baby? Do you, are you angry at the baby? Are you angry at your spouse? Uh, and we always ask, you know, and moms who are expressing the a concern about postpartum depression, we always ask, are they thinking about hurting themselves or hurting other people? What kind of answers do you hear to those? Well, you can almost tell the response bef- in nonverbal cues. Uh, you know, you can just tell the, this person who you've known through their pregnancy seems to have a different personality or they're, they're very withdrawn or they they just seem exhausted. Uh, so those, those moms typically will just say it's really hard and, uh, I don't have any help. Uh, the anxiety that I thought I had gotten rid of is now back with a vengeance. So you know, eventually I think we can get a a really honest, open response, but people are sometimes embarrassed by that, which they shouldn't be. Um, and people are certainly frightened by it. Do you, uh, is this something that's the same as when you started in practice or is it, has it changed over time? Boy, I feel like the, the dialogue has gotten better. I think there's more comfort in talking that for that patients have more comfort talking about these things. And, and I don't know if it's, the way I've looked at it differently or if the, as a society we've sort of shifted and that it's not a, something to be embarrassed about or consider a taboo that it's just a well-known fact that it can happen to people who felt perfectly fine in the past, but now they're really dealing with some serious depression. I remember when I first heard about this, you know, like postpartum depression, you're like, okay, well maybe depression. But like when you add in the insane amount of stress that goes on, I'm sure the physical toll on the body and then the sleeplessness. I mean, that that was the thing that even just as the dad, like that was so much harder on me than I ever thought in my wildest dreams. Because I had worked on ships where I would, you know, work several nights in a row. No, no big deal. This was a whole different thing. It is. And people can tell you about it. People can spell it out for you. But until you experience it yourself, you don't really know. Uh, and it is tough. And and for all three of our kids, I remember vividly remember about a month in thinking, God, 
this is so hard. And like you said, I was just the dad, right? So imagine what what mom's going through. And uh, so you did struggle with it. It was hard for you. Like you, Definitely. I imagine like the OBGYNs got everything. How did you balance it with your with your wife? Like the duties and the responsibilities. Well, yeah, I mean, she would always fact check me. <laughs> so whenever she had a question, you know, she would always take that question or, or my answer to her doctor and That's say, good to so, know. you know, Tim seems to think, and of course, actually when our first was born, I was only in medical school. So I really was pretty worthless at that point uh, as far as being an OB, but, um, but no, we, we always laughed about that. The funny thing that my wife went through, it's funny now, but at the time it was, a little pitiful. Uh, I came home from a medical school class and she was, I still remember she was sitting at the kitchen table, just tears pouring down her face. And she's flipping through my book. That's called the developing human, which has all the horrible things that can happen to a baby. <laughs> and she's doing this while she's like 20 weeks pregnant. And she was like, our baby has you know every problem in this book. And uh, it, it, I started to understand that, you know, emotions were going to be swinging uh, more than usual. And I, uh when you think about the responsibilities of being up at night, these kinds of things, you have one of these jobs where you've got to be sharp, you know, you've got to be, how did you guys handle that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a training kind of like anything else you go through physically, uh, where you, you, you have that time from when you get up out of bed to you're in the car, you're driving to the hospital and you do, you really have to wake your brain up. Uh, so sometimes just roll the windows down on a cold night, blast the music loud, you know, slap yourself in the face, you know, all, all the tricks, a little cold water on the face helps. Uh, but you realize, look, I've got about eight minutes where I've got to get, I got to be on and ready to go, especially if you're going in to do an emergency C-section or something. Uh, and you know, you, you, you can't afford to be shaky. So your part of the process is about eight minutes. You said, well, I was saying to get to the hospital. Oh, that's okay. sort of your, that's <laughs> like, you have this time to like your, like your meditation you did before. Yeah your C-section, you know, you have this time to prepare and, you know, it's eight to 12 minutes for me to, to, to physically get there. So when we, when we were getting ready to have our child, right, we waited a really long time. And I tell this all the time to young men, I feel like no one told me that there was a clock. I feel like I was kind of given this Peter Pan style you know, hey, you just go live your life as much as you want. And then when you're ready to be a parent and now looking back on it, I think that advice or that that kind of cultural idea was really negative for me because it, it pushed us to making chances where we got into the position where like, hey, if we don't make this happen relatively soon, it may not happen at all. Right. Have you noticed that cultural shift? That's interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, I think if we go back a generation or two, uh, it was sort of like, you get out of high school, you do college, you get married, you have a baby and better have that all go on by the time you're 30. Uh, so yeah, I think careers have pushed childbearing later and, uh, advice like you were just hearing, uh, from parents or, or other people. Uh, yeah, I can see how that would, would shift the timeline later, but you're right. There is a window of opportunity. The, the, the fertility doesn't last forever. Uh, and so, Striking a balance is, is, as usual, probably the better option. What is the window? Well, fertility really drops at the, when a mom is 40. Uh, and obviously, women have babies over the age of 40 naturally all the time, but it's, uh, the odds are much, much lower. Uh, so I usually tell patients, you know, let's say I'm talking to a 28-year-old who says, I'm not really sure I've got this career, and I'm not really sure when I'm going to be ready to have children. What do you recommend? And I usually say, make your decision by the time you're 35. That doesn't mean you have to have a baby by the time you're 35, but you want to make your decision about will I or won't I have a try to have children. Uh, and by the time you're 35, you really should have that decision in your mind. The younger you are, the safer it is, uh, because there's also a risk of things like Down syndrome and that uh, type of chromosomal abnormality that goes up with age as well. Uh, and so that's a, that's a competing issue with waiting. You know, in other words, Waiting to have your career develop is a wonderful thing in many ways, but it also has a dis that disadvantage. Yeah, I, I back check this with you. I've heard recently that there is a correlation with autism from the age of the father. Is this something you I, I've read that too? And and correlation is always a word that most of us uh, recoil a bit when we hear because it's such a loose 
association or a loose, uh, maybe non-scientific kind of a connection. Uh, so uh, autism is one of those, partic- is in particular one of those things that very little is known about its origin uh, and what, it's, what, what associations actually lead to a problem. So whether dad's age, Pitocin has been implicated in a, as a cause for autism. Oh, really? All sorts the, the of the drug to induce right. Whoa! So I, we, we for years we've heard that as a as an admonition from patients. We don't want any pitocin because we heard it can cause autism, to which there's no proof. Uh, but um, yeah, so but to to the point you were making about the the dad study, I read that as well. I I don't know what that will turn into. And for moms that have a baby later. You know, the 35-year-old mom versus the 25-year-old mom versus the 15-year-old mom. Mm. What's the difference for the how they're how they bounce back and how this all works? Well, geez, I, yeah, 15 is a whole different category because I think just in terms of their their lives, uh, they're probably not prepared yet to take care of a baby because they're still children. But um, their bodies really aren't ready either. You know, they can physically become pregnant. They can physically have a baby, but they're hips probably had their pelvises had probably haven't developed fully. And, uh, they do have a higher risk for preeclampsia at very young ages like that. Their blood, they can not handle the physiology of pregnancy as well. So their blood pressure can shoot up. This is fascinating because my impression was that we've like delayed it from, you know, like whenever they were doing it in olden times and my imagination is 15, but you don't, you don't think that's, that's probably too young physiologically. Uh, I mean, they're obviously all 15 year olds aren't the same, but as a general rule, I'd say that they're physically not really ready. Certainly emotionally, financially, all the other aspects are, uh, are important too. Probably the sweet spot and, you know, like the ideal time, uh, physiologically, physically is around 20, early twenties, uh, when the body is really ready and, and lowest complication rates, that sort of thing. And then, uh, as they get into 25, 30, what makes, what becomes more yeah, I'd say 25 is still within that window of, of optimal physical health and, and that sort of thing. 30 is still, I mean, obviously, we have lots of people who are pregnant at 30, 35, and, and in the upper 30s. Uh, and most of the vast majority of those folks do extremely well. It's just that these odds, these curves are starting to work against patients as they get uh, closer to 40. I think that your field is in a really difficult position because in many ways, innovation is kind of uh, a scary thing. I think back to the time when they thought they had a drug for morning sickness, and then it turns out, no, actually, if we didn't understand exactly how this molecule works, we have, you know, created really dark things in the world. How does innovation happen in the world of babies? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Um, I would say that we're... What was that that drug? That well, we it, might, it might be thalidomide that thalidomide, you're thinking that's of. that's right, right, yeah. Uh, and there was another, there is another drug or was another drug called DES or diethylstilbestrol, which was uh, used to, to reduce miscarriage rates. And uh, that also had terrible effects on uh, developing fetuses. Uh, and those are effects that would carry on throughout that patient's life. So we, we have some, uh, some women now who are generally maybe in their upper 50s and 60s who were exposed as fetuses to DES. And they have these ongoing issues, mostly with their own reproductive tracts. Uh, thalidomide caused uh, limb defects, you know, where the arms wouldn't grow to proper lengths, and they would just sort of be a very short arm with a, a short arm with a hand on it. Uh, it was never marketed in the U.S., and it's actually a great story that I'm going to get the details a little wrong. But uh, there was a woman who worked at the FDA when thalidomide was trying to be passed, and I want I want to say this was in maybe the 50s. Um, and it was being used in Europe and that's where some of the data was first recognized that it could have this birth defect if it was taken at just the wrong time. This woman at the FDA was a hero in that she recognized that there was something missing from the data that it didn't appear to be as safe as it was originally advertised, so to speak. And she blocked it and thank God, because she saved a lot of babies. And then when you think about the new medicine, you know, somebody comes along and says, hey, we've got this new way to do uh, induction. How, how, how does that even, how does that make it into the world? It's a long climb, right? I mean, those companies have to go through enormous testing to prove that something is safe. So there's animal studies, of course. And then, 
you, it's very, very difficult to get a drug, especially a new drug, tested in human pregnancy. It almost never happens. So usually what happens is a drug is not approved for pregnancy, but it's sort of out in the community. Uh, and then it gets used by women who happen to become pregnant. And then the data develops. Well, we have now a thousand women who didn't realize they were pregnant and they were taking this drug and there was no problem. So that's how safety data is. Uh, it's called a registry. A safety registry is sort of developed. Yeah, I've, I feel like, you know, having worked in biotech, like it's always hard to introduce anything in the U.S., particularly to humans. But you think about babies and you think like no, nobody wants to be on the nobody's an early adopter there. Right. No like way. it's like <laughs> it's no like, so way. Right. Because you just have to hear one story like the thalidomide story and you think, well. I'll just have nausea, you know, I'll just, yeah, I'll just I'll do just the natural endure. childbirth, the right, uh, right, exactly. non-medicated, right. Unmedicated. Right. So, um, when you look back on your life, you're, you're a dad, how did being a dad change you? Wow. Um, it was always something that I wanted to be. So really? I think it was more of fulfilling a dream than it was, wow, this is something I never realized uh, what's going to happen to me. So, and my wife felt the same way, you know, from early on in our relationship, getting to dating and getting to know each other, that was something we identified immediately about each other that we both wanted to be parents. And so it was, again, a realization of a dream for us. And fortunately my wife was amazing and had great pregnancies and three unbelievable kids. And, uh, now looking back on, on being a dad, what do you tell your children about, what it will be like for them to be a parent. Yeah. I'm actually going to be a grandpa in January. Oh, so this hey, is a very relevant question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Our, our oldest is a daughter and she's having a daughter. Uh, and yeah, I, I haven't figured out quite how to say that to them. Like what, what is being a parent really going to mean to you? What, what are, what are the trials and tribulations? Uh, I think I'm still formulating that obviously in my, uh, in my mind, but, I think that our kids realize how much we cherish being parents and how involved we've been in our kids' lives. And my wife is amazing at, at staying in up to date with what's going on with them. Uh, and so I think they will mo hopefully model their parenting after that, you know, heavily involved, uh, kind of approach. When you think about the, all the questions you've been asked over the years about like, you know, about to have a baby, all these things going on, what are the, What's the question you think, like, that's a really good question. People should be asking this as they're heading into having a baby. Yeah, I love when people, uh, uh, particularly dads, you know, ask me, what can I do? Like, how can I be helpful in this process? Because they realize what we talked about earlier, that they're kind of on the sidelines a bit and they're a bit powerless to really affect any significant changes uh, in the process. Uh, so I love when dads ask that question. And I usually just talk about, you know, of course, being supportive and understanding that your wife is changing physically and emotionally uh, and, you know, gi giving a lot of grace for, for all of those things. Um, but uh, I, I tell patients, if you're ever concerned about a decision, the best thing you can say to me to get my best answer is, what would you do if this was your wife or your daughter, you know, put me in the position you're in and ask that question. Uh, cause I say, I, I will be very honest with you because we're trained to give options. Oh, you could do a, B or C in my mind. I'm thinking, well, I would do C for sure, but a and B are certainly acceptable. Uh, and so when patients sort of give me the freedom to speak, uh, freely about what would I do? Uh, I'm always as honest as I can be. Oh, that's interesting way to put that. that. If they give you the freedom to speak that way, because at its core, I know for me, I'm, I do want to know, well, what would you do? Right. Mm -hmm. That, that carries a lot of weight with me. Yep. Yeah. And, and we, we don't want to force somebody into a decision just because that's what we would do. Cause maybe it's, there's a religious basis or some other reason for making that choice. Uh, but when they ask me, now, now it's go time and I'm going to tell them exactly why I would make my, what the decision is and why I would pick that decision. And in the world of being asked questions, you have this, uh, difficult, uh, reality of things like malpractice, uh, and being sued. How has that impacted your being a doctor? 
Well, I mean, it's something every everybody who goes into OBGYN realizes is a, is a significant part of our careers. I, I recognize that when I was in residency. And so uh, as a chief resident in your fourth year of residency, you have to give what's called a grand rounds, which is basically just a long speech that lasts for an hour or so. And so you get to pick your subject. And I picked medical malpractice in OBGYN because we, were, we had no training on it. It wasn't really part of our OBGYN residency, even though it's a major, it's, well, it's the like number three line item on my, you know, on my expenses. expenses yeah. yeah. So, uh, after, after three, rent and no personnel, kidding. yeah, wow. it's, it's a huge cost. And so, uh, I wanted to understand more about it early on. Uh, and so I, I gave that talk and of course did a lot of research to provide, uh, prepare for that. But yeah, it's, it's just a reality that we live with every day. And I, I, try to tell patients things that I think are significant risks. Um, you know, a, a, one example is shoulder dystocia where the shoulder of the baby can be stuck at the time of the, of the natural vaginal or the vaginal delivery. Uh, and you know, patients really don't have any understanding of that if they're not in the industry of, of delivering babies. Um, and when a baby is predicted to be very big on an ultrasound, we worry more about that issue, although it can happen to a baby of any size. And so you're that that's such an interesting thing because you're kind of balancing between I don't want to freak the mother out unnecessarily, but I need to tell them enough that they have this wide view so it doesn't it doesn't come off as malpractice. Right, exactly, and that's a great way to put it. Uh, it's funny because I, ha- I have a little bit of an argument with one of my partners who I've been partners with for you know a long time, uh, and she says exactly that. She says, "Well, I don't tell people that because I don't want to just freak them out." And my response is, "Well." but they need to know about it. I mean, it's something that can happen and it's a, it's, this should be a shared decision. This should be a shared risk that we're all aware can happen and, uh, you know, and try to get the best outcome. Um, so you're right. It is a balancing act for sure. So we have gone through all the difficult parts of pregnancy all the way up to malpractice and moms recovering from, you know, surgery, things like that. What is, uh, what's a, joyful story. What's a, what's an experience you had where you got to hand a, a baby off and have real joy? Well, I, I have a great answer to that. I had a, uh, a patient come to me who had delivered a stillborn at about 31 weeks, 32 weeks. Uh, and young couple, he, he was a, a training physician, delightful mom, and they were devastated. You know, this is a family, this is a couple who really, really wanted to build a family. And, uh, and they just had this devastating experience with another physician at a different hospital and they decided to change and they had gotten my name through various channels and, uh, they just felt like they needed a a fresh start. Uh, so I felt an enormous responsibility now as they're going into their next pregnancy that everything turned out as best it possibly could. So when they had their baby and I handed Mikey, uh, to the mom and the dad, they were just tears of joy. It was just devastating. It just filled me with so much happiness and joy and pride and, uh, and good things, uh, that this couple who really deserved to be parents and are wonderful parents, they finally got there. Uh, then they, a few years later, they went on to have a set of twins and a few years later, uh, my wife and I became very close friends with them because they're actually neighbors. Uh, so I get to see them all the time. So I'm, I'm getting to watch these kids grow up uh, in this family. Wonderful. That's perfect. If uh, people heard what you had to say and they thought, hey, that's a, that's a care clinic I want to be a part of, how would they go about finding you guys? So my pra- our practice is called Women's Care Consultants. At, uh, we're at Missouri, our offices, we rent space at Missouri Baptist Hospital. Uh, and I have myself and three other partners who are just fantastic ladies. It's Angela Reining, Jennifer Meyer, and Sarah Cussworth. We have three great nurse practitioners as well. So yeah, we're, we're happy to take care of people. It's what we do. I will say that, uh, my, my family, my wife and I were, uh, were guided to a path of like pure joy and feeling comfortable and confident. And you really like had a major positive impact on our lives. So it's been Nothing but an honor to be here with you today, Dr. Tim Philpot. Thank you, Vance. Well, and it's been an honor to be here with you today and to help take care of your family and your, your wonderful wife, Anne.
Well, thanks, and we'll have you back on again sometime. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around to the end of the interview. As a special treat, we'd like to show you what it's like to be in a legacy interview with another clip from Ben Lawler talking about brotherhood, starting businesses, and his drive through liquor business. If you'd like to learn more about legacy interviews, go to legacyinterviews.com. Brotherhood to me means, uh, means love, you know, it means protection, you know, early on, gosh, I was number four out of six, right? So three older and two younger and man out of all my closest relationships i would say my five brothers are right there at the top right so we talk on a regular basis you know over the years we've had some great business ventures together some have made it others have not uh, but a few in particular um gosh going back about five years we bought a liquor store down in southern illinois drive through right so i have two brothers that practice law there in Marion, Illinois. I have uh, two other brothers that work for Tom James. So three of us are with the Tom James company. And then the oldest still runs the farming business. Uh, specifically, he's into cannabis and hemp. And we currently have the highest rated CBD product in the state of Illinois. But going back about five years, we uh, acquired a liquor store. It was drive through And as brothers, we were able to work on that together. So it was great combining our, our relationships and our business acumen to, to build a business together. When you were kids, can you think of a time when you got in a lot of trouble with your brothers? Yeah, I can think of a few. Um, right off the bat, my older brother, Adam, who uh, he's number three, right? So if I was born in 1980, Adam would have been 78, right? So Adam was a punter in high school, you know, long legs, just, just a strong dude. One day we were getting into it, right? Really, you know, pretty serious fight. We were trading punches and I remember rearing back to punch Adam before I could uh, make a fist, Adam kicked me right in the hand and broke all four fingers. Oh, and Vance, I don't know if you've ever tried to punch somebody with four broken fingers. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Right. So. <clears throat> So I hit him once, but it didn't really connect, right? And we were right next to the swimming pool at the time, which my parents had just put in. And uh, Adam saw that I was that I was wounded, right? And he just he took advantage, and he just caught me right right in the face, knocked me into the pool. And uh, shortly after that, my father came home, and uh, he was pretty upset. You know, he said, "Boys, what's going on here?" We we explained the situation. Um, he told me to sleep on it, right? I, these four broken fingers. I said, dad, I think I need to go to the hospital. He said, we'll go tomorrow. But that next morning, man, it was swollen and it was purple. And um, I knew that, um, yeah, we probably, we could have settled that fight, that disagreement a little bit differently. But uh, um, I learned at that time to, to settle disputes with words instead of your fists. When was the last time you physically fought one of your brothers? <clears throat> well, I, uh, I wrestled in college and, uh, I was on the boxing circuit for a while. So, um, not at a very high level, but, uh, with the brothers, I would say it's kind of like, uh, the rooster complex. Whenever we go home, it's not full on fist fights, but there's a lot of wrestling matches, <laughs> right? There's a lot of shirts being taken off and Hey, who's the big dog. That's right. amazing. Um, but fist fights, not, not that often wrestling matches quite often.